Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we're going to continue our Best in Star Wars series. We've already covered the best soldiers and the best starfighters. Now we're going to move on to the best ground vehicles. Despite all the technological advances in the Star Wars galaxy, armies still use scout and recon units to screen their movements and find enemy formations. These scout troopers would need fast, reliable, and quiet vehicles. My go-to vehicle for smaller units like sniper teams would be a speeder bike. They're relatively quiet, very quick, and can traverse any type of terrain, and are small enough that they can be concealed or hidden should the sniper team need to advance on foot. I would go with the Imperial 74Z speeder bike. It was a pretty decent machine and included a communication jammer, which can come in handy if someone spots you and tries to call in backup. Although with a top speed of 500 kilometers per hour, which is roughly more than 300 miles per hour, it'll take a good amount of discipline to not kill yourself on this kind of machine. I'm not a huge fan of the ATST, which is oftentimes used by Imperial Scout Troopers. While they might be useful against riots in an urban pacification mission, they're far too exposed to be used on a battlefield. I would say this rule applies to walkers in general, but there is one walker I would employ, and that's the ATRT, or All Terrain Recon Transport. They're slightly more armor than most speeders and are much easier to control for the average soldier. Because of their legs, they would be able to traverse extremely difficult terrain without having to fly several feet above the ground. Armed with a laser cannon and a mortar, they would be pretty useful to support the vanguard of an assault. Still, I would only use ATRTs in specialized units, because they're just too exposed and can only be used in certain situations. While they were relatively successful against the Umbarans during the opening hours of the Battle of Umbara, I still wouldn't chance that kind of assault over open ground with them. If I had to carry out an attack over exposed ground like the clones did at Geonosis, my go-to vehicle would be the Mandalorian Basilisk War Droid. This extremely capable machine was more of a mount than a vehicle. It had an AI brain which meant the Basilisk War Droid could operate without a driver and also develop an emotional bond with its driver. They could fly and house the huge amount of weapons. They were so deadly that after Revan defeated the Mandalorians, the conditions for surrendering included dismantling and disarming all of the Basilisk droids. Now in our last episode where we covered the best starfighters, I mentioned the U-Wing for its maneuverability, speed, and armament. It is limited, however, by its small payload of only 8 passengers. The low altitude assault transport was my second option. Whereas it was pretty vulnerable to enemy fighters, it was fast and well armored enough against ground fire that it made a very effective transport. Carrying up to 30 soldiers and armed with an assortment of cannons, laser turrets, and projectile launchers, this imposing assault ship would be a great way to insert into a battle. Other variants of the LAAT could even carry large vehicles into the battle. But even with all that armor, the LAAT is still vulnerable and can be shot out of the air. It's also relatively expensive to operate compared to ground-based vehicles. For normal ground transport, I would use the Imperial Troop Transport. It's a repulsor-powered craft that does reasonably well over most terrains. It's also armored against most small arms fire and has defensive turrets. For assaults against heavier targets, I would consider using the HAVWA-6. It has several sets of gigantic towers which can power the tank up to 150 kilometers per hour, which is really impressive considering its size, which consequently is also its biggest disadvantage. At over 30 meters high, it was almost 10 stories tall and a huge target for the enemy. Luckily, the A6 had extremely thick thermal conducting armor, which meant it could withstand a fair amount of punishment. As far as main battle tanks, I don't really have any favorites. The walkers, while powerful, present too large of a target, whereas smaller walkers like the ATATE aren't heavily armored enough and quite slow. Then there's the hover tanks, which are too lightly armored as well and can't really withstand a direct hit from most heavy weapons. The Empire had a combat assault tank that had treads on it, but it was way too slow. The Empire also upgraded some Separatist hover tanks designs and created the TX-120 Saber tank, which had much heavier armor. But the problem with all these vehicles is that they relied on line-of-sight weapons like laser cannons or energy beam weapons. Since no one really wins during a close-range exchange of heavy energy weapons, I'm going to decide to use something that's a little longer range. The Separatist Alliance invested tons of resources on developing missiles and platforms to launch them. These kind of weapons were just as potent as any energy weapon, and they also had a much longer range and could attack things that were out of the line of sight. The IG-227 Hailfire class droid tank was relatively mobile and had 30 guided missiles on board, along with laser cannons. Deployed correctly, they could destroy most walkers and hover tanks far before they came into firing range. For artillery, I would use the Separatist Super Tank. It had a pretty robust assortment of weapons, including a rapid-fire mortar cannon and guided missile launchers, both of which could easily take out an ATTE with a direct hit. 
The super tank also had ridiculously tough armor and could withstand a direct hit from an AV-7 anti-vehicle cannon. Basically, the 88mm anti-air cannon of its era. Its only weak spot was underneath it, where it had very little armor. But since it's used primarily for artillery, you're probably not going to worry about landmines. The J-1 semi-autonomous proton cannon is another interesting alternative. Since it was based on a walker platform, it had the ability to cover all types of terrain and could be operated by a droid, or even fire itself. It also was powerful enough to take out an Acclimator-class assault ship, giving it some anti-air abilities, which is really important. Although we're talking about ground units, Star Wars combat, just like combat here on Earth, is heavily focused on controlling the air and space. It doesn't really matter how powerful your ground forces are if the enemy can park a capital ship in orbit and rain down destructive turbo laser fire onto your position. That's why anti-capital ship weapons are just as important as anything else. While the J-1 could shoot down lower level ships, what really did the job was the Grand Army of the Republic's self-propelled heavy artillery platform. Officially, it's used for supporting ground troops with its giant turbo laser, but it's equally effective at taking down capital ships. The SPHA also could be equipped with ion cannons, which could take out the shields for a capital ship and disable the propulsion of a ship, which can be really deadly once it's in atmosphere. Talking about ships, in our next episode, we're going to continue this series by looking at my ideal fleet of starships. Now, if you guys can't wait, don't forget to check out the other videos. We've covered uh, infantry and also starfighters so far. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.